Well, I've entitled our message today, Discerning Genuine Faith. And like I said to you before, our focus will be in the first letter of John, focusing on chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. To get a better context, I would like us to read back from the start. So we'll go back to the first chapter of 1 John. I'm going to read from the first verse up until our passage today. So if you're there with me, 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we've seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purifies us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. Chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Verse 3, now to 6. We know that we have come to know Him, if we obey His commands. The man who says, I have come to know Him, but does not do what He commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys His word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. I'm going to pray before we start our lesson today. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to You in expectancy, knowing, trying to know what You have us to know, Lord. We know that um, Your Word accomplishes certain purposes, Lord, that sometimes are secret to us. We know, Lord, that uh, we are here because we've been drawn by our Spirit to be here. So help us, Lord. Help me to be clear. Help the people here to be ministered to. And speak to everyone's hearts, we pray today. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, verse 3. We know that we have come to know Him if we obey His commands. That's what John's stating to begin with. It's not reflected on the NIV translation, but in the Greek, verse 3 starts with a connecting word in the Greek called kai. It connects uh, to back to verse 5 of chapter 1. And it's important to understand the argument because as we go back to verse 5 in chapter 1, we read, and this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light. So therefore, he's connecting This is who God is. Therefore, if you claim to know this God, you ought to do such things. So in order for us to understand this reasoning, we need to remind ourselves of the situation John was facing when he wrote this letter. So John is in his old age. Most believe he was in his 90s, so he's very old. And there were no other apostles left alive by the time he wrote this letter. By the time of his writing... Um, the Lord Jesus Christ was seen like 60 years before He ascended on high. Two decades have passed since the temple was destroyed and the Christians were dispersed. So, the believers heeded the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to flee to the mountains and they did. And some of them, perhaps with the Apostle John, ended up in the region 
of Ephesus in the Roman province, modern-day Western Turkey. It is believed that the Apostle John was overseeing a network of churches around Ephesus, some of which we can learn about by reading the first chapter of Revelation, because John was the same author, and he speaks about the condition of those churches in those days. Now, surprisingly, as you begin to read the letters in the New Testament written to several of the churches in the New Testament, surprisingly, we see that most of the division and quarreling was coming from inside the church. You wouldn't guess that. You would guess that the opposition would come from the outside. But some of the division came from within. False teachers with false doctrines led to sinful behavior and lifestyle in the congregations. And it is no different in this letter which John is writing to at that time. He wants to stop what's happening. He wants to step in, protect them, care for them, instruct them, this church. So who are these people? Now I need you to come with me. We're going to do a little survey on the chapters after to understand who these people are, that John is addressing them now. So, 1 John chapter 2, verse 11, just a few verses after. Verse 11, we can see that they were spread, spreading hate in the church. Verse 11, but the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is because the darkness blinded his eyes. Verse 15 of chapter 2, they were living sinfully. Verse 15, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Also, they rejected and abandoned the church. See in uh, verse 19 of chapter 2. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have maintained with us, remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. In verses 22 to 23 of chapter 2, they were false converts. Read with me. Who's the liar? It is the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. Verse 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Flip another page, chapter 3, verse 7. They were leading others astray. Verse 7 of chapter 3 of 1 John. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what it is right is righteous. Just he is righteous. Chapter 4, flick another page. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. They spread false teachings. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And lastly, on the same chapter, verses 2 and 3, the following verses, they were teaching false doctrines. Verse 2, this is how we can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Verse 3, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. So, we can get a better flavor now of the kind of people John is dealing with. John is addressing the collateral damage that they've done to this congregation of believers by these false converts. But at the same time, he's not only opposing them and exposing them, but he's also reassuring the ones that stayed behind, trying to care for them, to give them instructions of, to stop the habitual sinful lifestyle that they were influenced by, the people that they respected. John began his letter in chapter 1, as we, if you've been with me and as you've been listening to the messages before, by establishing, first of all, the apostles' teaching. Because some of them didn't see Jesus, they didn't witness his miracles. The Bible was not ready as a unit, so they had to trust the apostles. And there was only Apostle John left. And if you, as we read before, chapter 1, and if you want to go back again, it's fine to the first verses. But I'm going to quickly remind you of what has he been building, what cases has he been building so far? What kind of instruction has he been teaching them? So he reminded them. First of all, that they have genuine fellowship with the God that they claim to confess. 
He reminded them who Jesus really was, remember? He shot down the false claims. He assured them in verse 1 that Jesus, that they confessed, has always existed from the beginning, was uncreated, and was eternal. So this was not just a normal man, this Jesus Christ. He was divine. In verses 1 and 2, John also argued for Christ's historical existence. Remember when he said, if you see, he testified that he heard, he touched, he uh, seen with his eyes, that, that, that he walked with Jesus, and he testified, can you see on the verse? He testified that Jesus is the word of life and grants eternal life. In verse 3, John assured that Jesus is as close to the apostle as the believers are close to him as well. He said, we have fellowship with him and you have fellowship with us. We have all together genuine fellowship. There was no special way or secret way as these false converts believed to have access to God. In verse 4, John caused and encouraged the, encouraged the believers to experience complete joy. You can have joy. In verse 4, and fellowship with God and their fellow believers. So after laying the foundation of their faith, the identity and authority of Christ to the apostles' teaching and witness, John now started to address the impact these false converts had on the lives of the believers. <coughs> so by the way of admonishing the false converts' claims, and at the same time teaching the believers to overcome their sinful lifestyle, probably influenced by these older false teachers, John exposed four reasons, which I've taught last time, why someone why someone or would be affected by sinful uh, lifestyle. How someone would overcome this sinful lifestyle that they were influenced by, these false converts. How could they overcome? Okay, John, we're in panic here. We don't know what's happened. The church is in shambles. How can we overcome our sin? And how can we see what true and righteous living looks like? And last message, I looked at four reasons why we fight with our sin and our habitual sin. First of all, it was due to a lack of knowledge of, about who God is. If you remember, verse 5 says, God is light. In Him there's no darkness at all. So knowing who God is helps you to overcome your sin. And it was lack of fellowship with God and other people too, verses 6 and 7, that caused someone to walk in darkness rather than light. They lacked concern for their sin. Remember when I taught that? They lacked concern for their sin, thinking they were, they were without sin. And they didn't feel any um, desire to confess it to the Lord. Remember? Because he was telling, if you'd sin, confess it to the Lord. And he will forgive you all sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And lastly, in verse 10, they had a false assurance. Because they believed they were incapable of sinning. But just before our passage today, in verse 3, John gave true assurance of forgiveness to the confessing believer. Because an advocate was standing there to defend and represent us to the Father. And to cleanse us with His blood, which purifies all sin. So now that John established the authority, the testimony about the Lord Jesus and who He is. And started to address the false claims that these false converts, converts were teaching them. By way of instructing His children in the faith. How can we stop this from happening in our church today? The Apostle John continues to address and admonish the believers not to repeat the same mistakes again. By giving them tests, evidences, teachings of how a true child of God should behave like and believe in. So in this portion of our text today, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6, there are at least two tests, two, not three, two, two tests for discerning true faith. Whether this be a way of self-examination or a way of not being naive when it comes to discerning the claims of people that proclaim to be Christians who might have some influence in our lives, even amongst us. My goal this morning is to highlight two tests of genuine faith so that you will be able to discern what true faith looks like in us and others. But Sandra, that sounds a bit judgmental. Are you talking that we should be discerning if people are really Christians? And you're telling us to examine ourselves? Well... Don't take it from me. I'm going to tell you. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 wrote, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So that's the Apostle Paul. And to the same church he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 18 through 19, 
For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it, in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So he wants us to be a tent, to be having a discernment, not to be naive, and treat everyone as a Christian and perhaps help them in this self-deception, right? And as we learn from the context, this is exactly what happened to the people who received this letter from John. And my hope, it, it, again, it, it doesn't happen to us. So, back to our text today. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. So the first test of genuine faith is simply obedience. It's a simple test. So we continue to read chapter, uh, verses 3 and 4. We know that we have come to know Him. What? If we obey His commands. Verse 4. The man who says, I know Him, but does not do what He commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. So, according to the Apostle John, this is how we know that we know God. This is how we know that we know God. This is how we know what genuine faith looks like. If we obey his commandments. Obedience. There's a difference then between saying that you love God, right? Saying that you're a Christian. A difference between professing to know Christ than actually being a true believer, a Christian. Anyone can say they are Christians, right? I bet you if you were to go outside now by the church and you'd speak to the first 10 people you find, they will tell you, yes, I'm a Christian, wouldn't they? But do they know God? Do they love God? Is their love for God evident in their deeds and attitudes and what they do, how they behave? Or is it just all talk but no walk? John writes that many claim to know God. See verse 4? The man who says, I know him. Lip service. We can say all we want. We can deceive each other. Or worse, deceive ourselves. The false teachers in the letter of John were self-deceived. They claimed to know God, but they were indifferent to his commands. They live like the world, as we read before. They themselves thought superior to others. They were not sensitive to sin. They were indifferent to the apostles' teaching, which basically means indifferent to the Bible, God's Word, because that was the New Testament was written by them. Paul, in his letter to Titus, in chapter 1, verse 16, you don't need to turn there, I'll read it for you, he speaks of people like these. He's saying, they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Well, I'm stepping out of the way. This is the Bible speaking, okay? So their lives, what happened? They polluted the church, their sinful lifestyle. They were leading some astray, like we've learned before, causing conflict, confusion, and division. And then what happened? They left the church in shambles. They went out from them. Now all the damage is done, and now the believers are there, not knowing what to do. We need to protect ourselves and not be so naive, so that what happened to that church doesn't happen here. You need to know if you know God. You need to distinguish genuine faith from counterfeit or false faith. Don't believe what you hear, believe what you see. Is there fruit of your confession? Obedience to your Lord. And what Lord is that? Everyone obeys. They either obey the Lord or the devil. In verse 4, John plainly said that they were liars. And they were believing a lie. They were living a lie. Obedience to God and His word were not a priority in their lives. Those are John's words in chapter 3 verse 8. He said, Whoever makes a practice, a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Every true believer will be obedient to God's commands. Every false convert will be obedient to the devil's commands. John wanted to establish this truth so that they would not be deceived again by false converts and be influenced by their sinful lifestyle. So we can have assurance of our salvation. We can have assurance if we truly love the God we claim to know. And the way we know is by our attitudes, thoughts, and actions. Obedience to God's commands. Surely you remember what, John, what uh, Jesus said 
What's the first thing that comes to you when we think about uh, loving Jesus, obeying his commands? Do you remember John 14, verse 15? If you love me, you will obey my commandments. But often the word obedience and commandments have this negative connotation, don't they? They sound bad and hard. Uh, sounds like work or a bunch of rules, a list of do's and don'ts. But the commandments Jesus requires to obey are actually pretty simple. And I'm going back to John again, chapter 3, verses 22 to 23. You don't need to turn there. John refers to believers obeying God's commands. And then he adds, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Don't you want to love? That's a good command. Of course, love has so many intricacies. He has patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. There's so many aspects to the fruits of the Spirit. But surely this is something good, is it not? Obeying God and Jesus. John will keep repeating this throughout the letter of John. This idea, the importance of obedience to God, the importance of loving others, and the importance of believing in Jesus Christ. Throughout this letter, about 40 more than 40 times, he's going to say that you may know, that you may know, that you may know. I want you to know. And loads more times, he's going to say love, 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 love. He wants us to know how to love. He wants us to know how to be like Jesus, as I'm going to tell you in the last verses of our text today. So doctrine is important, isn't it? Without it, we cannot distinguish right from wrong. Truth from falsehood, genuine from counterfeit. That's why we need this. That's why we need this, to come alongside, be exposed to the truth, and then apply that truth in our lives with the help of the Holy Spirit. So before we move to our next point, just a disclaimer. Obedience is not the means by which you are saved. Salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. And you know where I'm going to go with this, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. But some people leave verse 10 out. Verse 10 goes on to say, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So there is an action to our faith, to our confession, isn't there? So what you do, to put it in a nutshell, what you do is a test of who you are, to put it simply. So obeying his commands is the Christian lifestyle, which leads us to the second test of genuine faith, which is found in verses 5 and 6. And that other test of genuine faith is change, transformed lifestyle. You're a new person. You're a different person. Verses 5 and 6. But if anyone obeys his word... God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Verse 6, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So the main way, the main way we can obey and become more like Christ is to get to know his word. Can you see verse 5? If anyone obeys his word. So to know his life, his commands, when we disobey, it shows our lack of personal knowledge of who Christ is. You need to know his word if you claim to know who he is. And you need to become like him if you claim to be his follower. So the closer you are to him, who is light, as we've learned from verse 5 of chapter 1, the more your sinful deeds and thoughts and attitudes are exposed. The more exposed you are to the light of his word, the more sensitive to sin you become. Either God's word will keep you away from sin... Or sin will keep you away from God's word. I've heard someone say. And verse 5 continues to say that as you keep, some translations might have keep, keep his word or obey his word, the love of God is made complete in you. This expression carries the idea uh, of continuous growth. Obedience is practice and God's love matures you. It matures you. There's a progression to your faith. It's transforming you, it's changing you, it's renewing your mind. His word shows you what he desires from you, and your love for him compels you to do what he wants. And this obedience is not burdensome, like John later goes on to say in this letter. So as you strive to be obedient, you start to experience God's love. 
as you start to experience what it means to be forgiven, you start to be able to forgive others more. Uh, you'll start to experience what it means to be patient, because he was patient with you, you'll start being patient towards others. You'll start to be kind as you recognize his kindness. You start to love others just as he loved you. You start to be gentle as he is gentle, humble as he is humble. You get the idea? Have you noticed how children copy their parents a lot? For you to have children, but you might have other relatives and you see they copy their parents, the good and the bad bits too. If they spend a lot of time with you, they will start to behave like you, won't they? Some children look up to their friends too. They copy their habits, their expressions. I had my children come with these, all these new expressions I didn't teach them because of their friends and the influence they had. For the parents with daughters, did you go through the frozen fever phase? Do you know what that means? <laughs> Remember when those films came out? Some, ch some children loved one character. Some children loved another. And then they wanted to dress like Anna, and they wanted to dress like Elsa, so you got them uh, Elsa dress, and you got them uh, Anna dress. They memorized their songs, they were singing their songs all the time, they were drawing pictures, coloring, coloring books, they have books bought, pencil cases, backpacks, even, even uh, when my wife was uh, Tidying their hair, can I have Elsa hair? Can I have Anna hair? They love them so much they wanted to become like them. I will tell you, if these movie characters were real people, the children would do anything they asked. And I, I'm telling you, even perhaps disobeying their parents, because they were in love with those characters. That's how much they love them. Their love compelled them to sing, dress, talk, imitate these characters. Their neighbors knew it. Nanny and grandpa knew it. Friends knew it. Everyone knew it. So the test of genuine faith is transformed life. We claim to love Christ. He's our idol. And so we sh you should walk like him, talk like him, be like him, right? It's true. A test of genuine faith is a transformed life. Are you becoming more like Christ more than last year? If we were to look now two, three years ago, were those sins that you were dealing with now dealt with? Or there's no change? Is there no progression in your life? Is there maturity, as verse 5 suggests? Because as John says, this is how we know. This is how we know we are in Him. This is how we know we're saved. Verse, verse 6 there, whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. And some translations have the one who says he abides in him ought to walk as Jesus walked. You notice the contrast between those that claim they know Christ but live like the devil and those who claim to know God and live like Christ. Now we know sin is hard to overcome. That's why our message lasts and John prepared them for this. If you struggle with habitual sin, just listen to the last message. It's, it's hard to, to overcome. But we have Jesus helping us. We have the Spirit helping us. We are the Word of God helping us. So in verse 6, living in, like some translations uh, write, or abiding means to habitually obey. It's a present continuum. Is continually obey. Just like the children would every single day want to see the same film, dress the same way, uh, sing the same songs, over and over and over. But do people know you're a Christian? Do you behave differently than what you used to before you were saved? Do your friends recognize the difference? Or are you just someone who is talking, talking, but not walking, walking? Did you know there are only three places in the Bible where believers are called Christians? Three times in the Bible where believers are called Christians, and I'm going to read them for you. The first one is in Acts 11:26, and I'm reading the passage. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So believers first started to be called Christians by the society, the culture in Antioch. The second instance is in Acts 26, verse 28. 
Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Agrippa mockingly identifies a Christian as a follower of Christ. And the third instance was in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, where Peter says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. So we get the idea to, to, that we identify as a Christian would bring shame to some. And other times, believers were also called followers of the way. Did you notice that in your reading? They were followers of the way. Such as time where Saul, before he became Paul, was persecuting believers. Do you remember that? He would recognize the believers as the followers of the way. Acts 9 verse 2 it says, If he found, that's Paul, any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So there was something different about those guys. He knows how to identify them and imprison them. But in uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 9, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So the way that believers lived was looked down by other people. Acts chapter 19, verse 23. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. That's how they call Christians. Those guys that follow the way. Maybe Jesus, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, so he's following the way. And also, lastly, where people even taught, uh, taught thought, sorry, that the people were a sect in Acts 24, verse 14. Whoever I, however, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestor as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. So that's the idea that the people had about them. But did you notice one thing? And that's the whole point. That what was often the cause was that unbelievers were calling them Christians or followers of the way. It wasn't us saying, oh, I'm a Christian as believers. It was them looking at their lives, looking at how they behaved and saying, they must be Christians. They must be followers of the way. There's something evident about them that the unbelievers recognize were different. Right? That's the interesting part, was it? Therefore, this highlights that the understanding that following Jesus is not merely a set of religious doctrines, but a way of life, a path of discipleship, to get to know the person that we're going to live our lives with forever. People ought to see Christ in you. We ought to see Christ in you, if you claim to know Him. Isn't that what the Apostle John is warning these brothers and sisters about? A false assurance of salvation? They were deceived to believe and influence the people who claimed to know God. But they were liars and the truth was not in them. So don't be deceived. Don't deceive others if you're not one a Christian. <laughs> But most of all, don't deceive yourself. Have discernment, everyone. Don't be naive. Let's protect our fellowship. Let's not play games. Church is not a game. Christianity is not a game. It was too late for the people in John's time that he had to write this letter. It's not late for us. Genuine faith is a commitment to walking in the footsteps of Jesus, embracing and obeying His teachings and living according to His example. If you're not being God then you're not living like Christ. If you're not living like Christ, you are living a lie. If you're living a lie, then who are you living like at all? So these are two simple tests of genuine faith. Obedience and a transformed life. Now, if you feel convicted by this message and you know that you do not know Him, there is good news. We know John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His Son, so that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So come to Him in repentance. Confess your sins to Him. Believe that He died and rose again so that your sins may be forgiven and trust in Him with your life, showing that you are His disciple. So if you're a believer, I hope that just as John exhorted the believers then to be discerning when it comes to recognizing genuine faith from false, that you can be better equipped now by God's Word with His Spirit to discern. And not to 
give way or license to someone to self-deceive, to be self-deceived. This will help you to now lead them to the truth. Right? There's nothing worse than a person that thinks that they're going to heaven and then the Lord will tell them, depart from me, I never knew you. Right? If we can help them now while they're still alive, we'll be our children. We might believe, oh, I think he's a Christian. Well, we'll see. By their fruits, we'll see. So let's not be naive. Let's be discerning. And if you need any help, you could always ask Pastor Jason or me, and we can castle you, help you, because that's what we're here for. We can teach you and help you. And before you leave, if you know someone in that position, there are some booklets by the offering box that, uh, are, uh, that says, examine yourself. You can take them for free and give it to someone who perhaps you don't have the courage to speak to, and they think they're a Christian, and just take it freely. It's, uh, it's by John MacArthur. It's in Portuguese. And it's examine yourself. And he goes through the scriptures saying, how do you know that you know you are a child of God? So these two are times of testing. Have the sermon. Don't be led astray. Okay? Two tests. Obedience and transformed life. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we acknowledge your goodness to us. You uh, guide us by your truth. Your word is truth. You sanctify us by your truth. You convict us by your truth. You uphold us by your truth. We want your truth. Your truth is the bread, is the food that we need. Jesus said that um, you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And so we look at your truth, we revel in his truths, and we ask you, Spirit, to help us have transformed lives. Lives that want to obey you and please you, so that others might see the hope that is in us and ask, why do you do that? Why do you take care of your children like that? Why do you work so well? Why are you such a good parent, wife, mother, father, whatever it is? We need your help, Lord. It's so hard. The world wants to get a grasp of us. Uh, the lies are sometimes uh, more pleasurable than the truth. But we pray, Lord, that by your Spirit, you would convict us and transform our lives so that we become more like you. Thank you for the tests you give us. Thank you for... Uh, being abrupt with us in this way so that we can be awake to fight the fight, the good fight, to run the race that is set before us and to uh, beat our body into submission, not letting it fulfill our sinful and lustful pleasures. Lord, uh, a life of loving you is hard, but you live the life of sacrifice, of giving your own life and humility so that you can save a people for your own possession. Thank you, Lord, for doing that for us. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen.